start up the engine and I'll just put it side by side. And, um, and so the, the initial prototyping, if I do, I'm gonna just put a, a sprite on the screen, right? So uh, yeah, X100, Y100, width 50, height, height 50, and then the path, I'll, I'll do sprites, uh, square, blue.png. So we've got some you know placeholder stuff in there. And I save the file and you see it show up on the screen, right? And uh, so to be to be straight, uh, because I think we didn't mention it, but there is a mention in the name. Dragon Ruby is a game mm -hmm. toolkit where you use Ruby the language. Ruby as uh, Ruby as a language, yeah. and so um, Ruby. I've done development for I think twenty five years at this point. Um, large swath of large swath of languages, uh, and uh, Ruby is one of the most powerful languages I have ever used, and I. Continue looking at and say, there's got to be a, there's there's one of the language, okay, Lisp. You've got uh, you've got uh, Lisp. You've got uh, your um, uh, your those, those specific dialects. I would say Lisp is the most powerful language uh, out there. But as far as like the second most powerful language I can think of, I mean, Ruby is Ruby is up there. Um, and you know, just for the syntax, uh, I'm basically you know defining a dictionary right here. So uh, args is kind of your environment, and I'm and I'm using the shovel operator and I'm saying, okay, put, put a sprite into this collection. Yeah. And so uh, those are the properties that, that exist on that. And with respect to like the complexity of the engine or, or, you know, scaling of a solution, this thing can take, you know, multiple types of objects, but from a simple prototyping, like this is the simplest thing that you could put in there. So um, if I have uh, let's say I have a tick count and uh, I want to mod that by 1280. Right. So, you can see it. Yeah, you, know, you can see it moving on the screen. Um, let me do our labels and uh, let's let's put the actual like frame on the screen the screen itself, so you can kind of see what uh, see what that value is. All right. So we have we have the we'll have the tick count displaying, and okay, it's a little small, so. Let's uh, set it to, I guess, 50 pixels, 60 pixels. There you go. So and that's your frame rate. You're now editing a file that is being uh, used for the game loop, right? The, mm -hmm. So the equivalent in the Unity would be the update for each of the component, but this is for entire engine. So what you're yeah. doing- So this is your entry point right here. Yes. And this is, this is triggered every frame. It's called tick mm -hmm. and it operates on the arguments which you can mm -hmm. get stuff into and then mm -hmm. get the stuff out. Yeah. So if I do, uh, so we, we've got this, um, uh, we've got the state uh, mechanism that is kind of a placeholder uh, for you to hold on to like any specific game state. So uh, let's say I, I want to hold on to the actual X position of the player, right? So I can set that to uh, player.x. And if I do, uh, I'll say inputs Q, uh, we'll just say uh, left, right. So left, right will return negative one, zero or one, depending on, you know, which way it's going, right? So we'll say a uh, player, uh, args that state that player dot X is equal to, you know, inputs left, right. And it's a really, really slow. So we'll add a speed to that, but there you go. I uh, see that's 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 one thing that like I'm trying to uh, envision how it would look like if I was using the other engine right and in the other engine you would need to go back pretty much to the code ch mm -hmm. change it and then recompile it and depending on the hot reload solutions for example in unity you can change things but the mm -hmm. some things will be updated some things won't and they will break the loop so to think that you can rely on this hot reload and pretty much you've seen that this was the, not enough for the speed, you need to speed it up. So multiply by a float and you can do yeah. it pretty much instantly. This is super cool. Yeah. This is super uh, cool. Yeah, and another, another interesting aspect is that we, we have a built-in heads up display also. So when you think about, when I think about like a built-in, uh, you know, an editor for your game, it, like, like your game is your IDE. Um, I know you think uh, like Blizzard and StarCraft, they, 
they have a map editor. They have a dedicated map editor for you know building out their campaigns. And so this idea of you know having having your your game be your IDE and being able to invoke functions and ex expand uh, extend your game in itself to help help develop the game uh, it is about that long term su sustainability. But with this heads up display, you know you you can you can evaluate whatever whatever code you want uh, within here. So I can define functions. So if I wanted to. Uh, we've got some, you know, top level functions for resetting the game state. So if you actually want to reset the game state, you know, you can do reset and it sets your frame rate, you know, back and it sets your, uh, sets your players. So we had our default player state at 640. And so it, it reset that location, but yeah, then after that, you're, you're just able to, you're just able to update. Um, and as you notice, like game state is retained. So. I can change the speed and then just you know continue uh, continue working from that perspective. And what is the what is the information that you can get? Because if you pull up the display, the f you get mm -hmm. uh, a block of information. What is the information usually uh, that you get from, like for example, the video backend, the renderer, things like yeah, that? Yeah, so okay. that's some, some that's some startup information okay. that you have. Um, it gives you uh, it gives you your rendering pipeline. So when I talk about rendering pipelines. Every every you know single uh, OS has a has a I guess their their de facto rendering pipeline, and it's important for a game to render using that rendering pipeline. Um, I, I see whenever I see like an engine say, "Oh yeah, we're cross platform," and oh by the way, we only support OpenGL rendering. Rendering, you know that's a that's a ticking time bomb. Um, and you're 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 distributing a game, uh, a commercial game that potentially will not work um, on on the platforms that you want to distribute to. And I think that's really important. So that's your rendering pipeline. Um, our logical canvas is always 1280 by 720. If you do portrait mode, then it's you know 720 by 1280. But you're always working with that logical um, uh, uh, logical canvas. And then we do all the high DPI scaling and, and aspect ratio resolution on our end. So, oh, so, so, so the resolution that you work with is 1280 is 720. But that's your logical resolution. Okay. Yes. And then it yep. will be scaled to different, different, uh, window sizes, depending on the, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, if you notice where, uh, this is scaling at uh, high DPI, right? So our native resolution we're uh, we're rendering at 1440p. So uh, as far as like texture atlases or sprites that you create, um, if I, it, it, you have your blue.png in code, uh, the convention that we use is if you have um, at at uh, at two x or at 720, 720p, that will, if you have a file with that name, we automatically uh, load those specific values in. So your code okay. doesn't change. You you say, this is my baseline, you know, 720p, uh, 720p resolution, and then you can progressively enhance for. Uh, for other systems, and the sixteen by nine aspect ratio, it, uh, sixteen by nine one from that perspective, you can build games uh, within there that you know have different varying resolutions, but uh, the baseline target for seven twenty p and the sixteen by nine aspect ratio was specifically because of the Nintendo Switch. So you go into when you're in handheld mode, you're you're running at seven twenty p. So that's kind of your minimum resolution. And then, from a from a logical standpoint of always never having to think about, uh, you know, the other. Uh, I think it's aspect of being a two D game is that we can think in pixels. So we can say your logical scale is twelve eighty by seven twenty, and uh, it supports you know sub pixel rendering, especially you know for high DPI stuff. But you think in you you think in that logical um, uh, logical resolution, and you're good to go. Okay, and that consistency helped. How would these? How would this project change if it had more logic, more files, things like, in you know, in a yeah. dark room, you have like a things that only happen after you reach something. So like, how would it evolve in terms of the oh, project? Yeah. yeah. So um, usually, usually, well, you know, you'll end up having like you know some kind of some kind of game class that that retains your information. So a, a real simple uh, refactor would be to um, you know put that code in here like that, and then uh, your args method 
I would I would set up like a, a game object, a global game object that a tick gets passed into, right? Okay. So we'll do that, and you'll notice that my game state is retained because of uh, because of the environment. Uh, let's say I want to uh, actually uh, reset my game state anytime I save the file. Uh, so I can actually just type gtk.reset at the bottom of any file yeah. and save, and it'll you know, reset the game state. So I don't want the game state to reset. Fine. Don't add that function in there. I want it to reset. I define the reset function and uh, invoke that in, in the file. So you, you end up with a game class, and then uh, if you have separate files that you want to include, you, you just require, you can, you, know, you can require them. So I can move that over into you know, app game.rb file. And so if I, you know, yeah, game.rb, move that over. I require it, save. All right, I'm good. Yeah. First of all, your ability to live code is incredible. And like, thank you. The thank you. speed I've... of that, like, it's not speed up and it looks like the video I would watch with like 1.25. Oh, yeah, this is, this is, this is real time. I, and I think it's, it, it's the it's that aspect of when when you can focus in on your solution and you're not having to do these context switches yeah. it's yeah the it's other really the other great. thing like that I, I think i uh, kept, keep mentioning this on this podcast like if you have a small enough team project you can have conventions that help you so much for example the thing that you reset on on save and then you can comment this out. There's just one line, and mm -hmm. it it like it makes so much, so much. If I think how this would need to be created in like other engines when they have their own abstractions layers, like to make sure that it's super easy to switch between them, it becomes so much more complex. And here you're just changing one one line, pretty yeah. much commenting out. And this this state variable is you know available. So if I want to set see the value right so right now it's it's i can set it to 100 there we go my game state is is reset and uh yeah based on those conventions i can i can do i can create a function called go to final stage if i'm you know actually testing like a specific a specific thing right so i can create a go to final stage method uh go to final stage and i'll set uh so I'm passing args in args dot state dot player dot x equals we'll set maybe that's yeah. that's what it does, right? So then go to final stage. Uh did I is that what I called it? Did I save that file? I didn't save the file. You have to save the file. Wrong okay. number of arguments. There's go no to final stage args. needs to take an args. Right. Yeah. So we'll just because it's a you know it's just a helper function. So we'll just we'll we'll just uh, pass it in globally. I forgot to save again. There we go. I'm okay. on the final stage. Okay. You forget to save. Yeah. Um. So then, like another aspect is like, well, I don't want to have to pass in args everywhere, right? I'm passing it in here, uh, here, and then I have to reference it in all these you know different areas. Um. So this is a facet of of Ruby itself. We, uh, there's something called um, they're called uh, class macros. So instead of instead of taking up um, uh, I guess an inheritance point, because I want the developer to be able to derive, right? I don't want you to have to pass in like you know some base object here, right? So uh, we use uh, we use a class macro that allows you to uh, that gives you gives your uh, component this uh, this capability. So here I'm uh, I'm able to remove args from you know all my all my little uh, functions, and then your 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 game. You set the property inbound. Uh, okay. And you're ready to go. Okay, and this is like it's already in scope. It's already like yep. pre-loaded. Okay. Yeah, and then and then this this class macro also defines your your state function, your outputs. So you're not having to you're not having to prefix everything with uh, okay. with args. Your debug functions, um, actually that that should work there too. I shouldn't. 
because the game is already preloaded with with args. So if I reset the game and then go to final stage, yep. Nice. Nice. And yeah, and that's that's the that's the life facility of of you know how you would how you would build out a game.